You're in the place where mysteries and the missing meet. Where conspiracies lurk around every corner. Welcome to the Deep Dark Truth. Welcome back to the Deep Dark Truth. I'm Mo. I'm Chip. And I'm Mikey. And today we are going to be discussing the death of Egypt Covington, a case that has recently come back into the news with the arrest of two suspects and was in the news over the course of the summer due to some protests that we will get into. We also would like to welcome Lindsay and Dwayne, who will be joining us towards the end of the episode. Dwayne is Egypt's brother and Lindsay is his fiance. They have been fighting to get justice for Egypt over the course of the last several years, so we are very lucky and thankful to have them here. Without further ado, let's jump right into the case. Egypt Covington was a 27-year-old woman from Belleville, Michigan. She loved to sing and entertain, and with practice became a fantastic cook, an improvement from her younger years when she threw everything in a pot. She was beginning to stabilize from her party mode adolescence and was saving money along with her boyfriend, Curtis, to leave her apartment for a bigger and better place. She had secured her first quote-unquote adult job at a distribution company. I want to take a moment to throw in some audio of Egypt performing as it was a passion of hers. And I'll rise up, I'll rise like the day, I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid, I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again for you. Beautiful, both inside and out. Her mother, Tina Turner Covington, was quoted as saying, quote, Egypt was beautiful. I mean, as she grew, she just turned into this striking beauty. When she walked into a room, everybody noticed her, unquote. Egypt was extremely social and had many friends from various aspects of her life that were fairly compartmentalized. Bartender friends, what she called daytime friends, yoga friends, and many of these friends wouldn't meet each other until after Egypt's death, and some would become friends themselves after. But others would believe that only themselves had Egypt's best interests in mind regarding how to get justice for her and who the perpetrator was. On June 22nd, 2017, Egypt's boyfriend Curtis was having a hard time getting in touch with her, and naturally he found himself on the doorstep of their shared duplex. Egypt's car was present in the parking area, and her front door was cracked open. When he walked into the apartment, he is quoted as saying, quote, I took a step in, two steps, and I yelled her name, Egypt, and her dog Ruby barked, unquote, and Quote, usually when you see Ruby, she just can't wait to jump in your lap and kiss you. But she just looked at me, made eye contact, and turned around like, follow me. Unquote. Curtis discovered Egypt, bound with Christmas lights, arms tied behind her in the fetal position, deceased. She had a gunshot wound to her head. Curtis called 911, and the investigation into the death of Egypt Covington had begun. It would last over three years, and conflicting opinions over what happened would cause rifts in her family. From the start, Van Buren Township Police had a suspect in mind. Egypt and Curtis had been dating for a decade, but multiple times throughout their relationship, they had periods of separation where they dated other people. During one of these periods of separation, Egypt had previously had a tumultuous relationship with her ex-boyfriend, Kenny, that involved emotional abuse and controlling behavior. Some friends and family members of Egypt felt that Kenny was the natural suspect. In the weeks leading up to Egypt's death, Kenny had discovered that Curtis and Egypt were moving in together and confronted them at a local festival. This seemed to contribute to the theory that was being propped up by Van Buren PD. But Egypt's mother, Tina, was reluctant to speak out against Kenny specifically, instead calling for justice concerning whoever may have killed Egypt. She also allowed Kenny to babysit her dog, Ruby, in the months after Egypt's murder. murder. Kenny loved Ruby, and Tina felt that she had no reason to deny him spending time with her. It also appeared that Ruby wasn't having any negative reactions to Kenny specifically. 
Unfortunately, some people took exception to that. But when Tina was asked about it by True Crime Daily, she said, quote, You know, I was raised to believe that you don't ruin someone's life without proof. Unquote. Mother Tina and Brother Dwayne, who will be joining us later, were becoming skeptical that local police had a firm handle on Egypt's case. They were voicing their concerns for things that were being overlooked and cautious to condemn a man that the police didn't have enough evidence to arrest. Those concerns were brushed off by the police repeatedly, and they were met with contempt by some family members. Things said online concerning them in my opinion, are honestly disgusting. Everything from the fact that they should feel guilty over not siding with the police, to them dishonoring Egypt's memory, to more crass and frankly disgusting things that I won't get into. There were also some misleading statements made online that led quite a few people to believe that Egypt's stepmother was her birth mother. A month after Egypt's passing, Dwayne met and started dating his now fiance Lindsay, who will also be joining us. This seems like a left turn, but stay with me because it's extremely relevant. Lindsay and Dwayne started having discussions about the progress of Egypt's case and conversations about who she was as a person, Egypt obviously being a large part of Dwayne's life and a constant focus in his very fresh grief. These conversations would eventually lead the family to hire a private investigator. The Van Buren Township Police did not seem to be making progress on the case, aside from naming Kenny a person of interest, and Dwayne and Tina had many lingering questions that weren't being answered. Ten months after Egypt's passing, in April of 2018, the family finally hired a private investigator. Through that private investigator, they discovered items that were missed, such as the police department never doing a tower dump to gather data, for example. The private investigator also interviewed the police department and subsequently told Tina and Duane things that led them to start questioning what the police were telling them. It was brought to their attention that they seemed to be getting some sort of misleading information from the police department concerning how exactly the investigation was going. Three months later, in August of 2018, Lindsay and Duane started a Facebook page titled Justice for Egypt, The Truth Behind the Investigation, in an effort to try and get Michigan State Police's attention. To say that those that were convinced that Kenny was the perpetrator were upset by this and upset by Duane and Lindsay advocating would be an understatement. Wild theories started being tossed around the internet from a certain faction. I don't want to give them too much credence, and I'm not going to name any of these people, but I think you need to hear how deranged and convoluted things get. So here is a highlight reel. Some of these theories included that Kenny and Lindsay were secretly dating, and that Lindsay seduced Dwayne, as if they were in some 1940s spy thriller plot, in order to keep Kenny out of jail. Also, that Lindsay was being paid by Kenny's family to derail the case. There are lots of other theories that I'm not even going to get into. If you are interested, there are a lot of screenshots and a lot of posts in the Justice for Egypt page, which will be linked in the show notes. For years, these sort of personal attacks would continue, and Dwayne and Lindsay would continue to utilize all of the tools in their arsenal in order to fight for justice for Egypt, whether that was private investigators, receiving tips, or maintaining the Facebook group. Which brings us to 2020. In the summer of 2020, Lindsay and Duane held two different events. The first was for the three-year anniversary of Egypt's death that was held on June 22nd. There was around 100 people at that event. The day after, Van Buren reached out to the Michigan State Police, and initially, the Michigan State Police were going to only assist on this case. This is around the time that I came in and started doing research for Egypt's case. And what happens over the course of the next several months would eventually lead to suspects being brought into custody. But now I think for this part of the timeline, this is the best time to bring in Lindsay and Dwayne so that you can hear a little bit ab about things from their perspective. Some of the things that we're going to talk about include a second event that took place after the first 
a few days later in order to get the case moved to only Michigan State Police's custody or chain of command or however you want to say it, and the events that led to them having a second event. So first of all, Lindsay and Dwayne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being on the show. I know especially today, which we will get into in a second, it is a crazy, <laughs> crazy day for you both. So I Yeah, really thanks for having it. us. For having us. <laughs> excited to be here and excited to share her story with anyone that wants to hear it. We always are happy to, to share it. <laughs> That's right. Before we get into the rest of the timeline, which we will in just a second, first, we're just going to start off talking a little bit about how this fight came to be. So, Mikey, I think you have the first question. What was your relationship like with your sister? Yeah, so we grew up together. Um, I'm 10 years older than her, so, you know, I was changing her diapers at one point. <laughs> but um, she was always outgoing and uh, just, uh, I guess, both of us were very similar in our um, personalities. So we both were kind of the life of the party action. So as we, you know, as um, we got older, uh, we always, we always connected well. You know, I, I went off and, and did other things in other places. Um, and as well, you know, while she was starting her bartending career and, um, and such. And we, you know, so when we, we weren't always hanging out together, but when we got to Christmas holidays and we did work together for a very long time, um, we just, and we always had so much fun <laughs> and it was too much fun actually. <laughs> so but working with the sibling actually worked good for you. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was hilarious. <laughs> she is so funny. And it's almost like a show where, you know, she's bartending next to you. If, you know, if I'm doing something and she'll mess with me and the, the, um, the, the patrons will just love it, you know? So we had a really good time. Well, it sounds like good tips. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we did well. <laughs> what would you say was your favorite thing about Egypt? Uh, I would have to say, I'd have to say her, Along with her personality, uh, being so boisterous and fun, she was, uh, non-judgmental. So that was a huge, huge thing with me is, you know, we spend a lot of our time and just from my personal, um, experience, we spent a lot of time with people that were very judgy, um, that did judge you off of either, you know, what you wore or who you were and, and quite frankly, how much money you made. And she, was not. She had friends all facets of life. Um, it didn't matter if you came from, um, if you lived down the lake with one of the big houses or right down the road in Sumter in a, in a trailer park, it, you were friends to be. You come, in, come into the bar, we have a good time, and um, she'll smile and she'll be your friend to the end. And it was, it was just a beautiful thing. It's so interesting to get to know people through their loved ones and their friends. And all of the kind of things that aren't included in articles about victims once they have passed because they're so focused on what happened to them instead of mm -hmm. who they are. In a strange way, just from the Facebook group that you guys have and people sharing their stories, I feel like I've really felt that. I felt yeah. that, like, easygoing, non-judgmental friend to everyone I seen so many of those little stories or little comments here and there but it's it's still so nice to hear it isn't it amazing it. i know it's amazing to hear all the stories and they never get old like it's never oh. and someone will say i'm sure you know this about her butt and it's like no 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 I, no keep telling us keep talking <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool it never gets old so there's been a lot of belligerent criticism some would say of your involvement in trying to get justice for egypt can you explain your journey in everything in coming to know Egypt through Dwayne and Tina and why she's become so important to you. So just speaking for myself, as someone who's in the true crime arena and is heavily invested in the victims that we cover and develops personal relationships with families, I understand that, but I don't want to speak for you. Yeah. So um, I guess to touch on that first part, I'm going to just touch on it real quick. Uh, I, I try to keep that out of 
my life as much as possible. But yeah, there has been a lot of criticism and me being so vocal and so involved in, in finding justice for the person that I love most for his sister. And, uh, I, I had, I never met Egypt. I didn't have that honor. I didn't have that pleasure of meeting her, but I, I feel like I know her, like you had just said a little bit ago that just, just through all of her friends and through Facebook stories and, and through clearly her brother, her mother, and, you know, her, her dog lives with us. And, and by Ruby being the way that she is, shows me what kind of mother Egypt was to her and would be to, to children, to anyone. And, um, the, the belligerent comments that, that are aimed towards me, I know are, aren't coming from, they're coming from a place of hate and it's, it's, I, yes, it hurts and I, I know of them, but I just have to block it out and I have to just keep my focus on, on Egypt and, and justice for, ev- so this doesn't happen to any other families. So that's been what's really been able to help me keep my focus is that no one else should go through what our family has been through. No one, no brother should ever have to go through what he has been through for his, for after the murder of his sister or mother, um, nobody, father, n- none of their family should, should have to go through this. And, so I guess what that then brings me to why, why I'm so involved and what, what really got me thinking. And, and I have to say that's because I have children. I have three children, two of which are boys. And as soon as I started figuring out that Kenny was, was the killer, that's what everyone was saying. That's what the, by everyone, I mean the police. And that's who I'm, police was saying, uh, some of the family members, Egypt's family members were saying that it was Kenny. I know it was him putting his name out there. And I just kept saying, whoa, if it's him, why is he still out there? He can do it to somebody else, and he can he can kill someone else. And if everyone knows that it's him, then he should be gone. So then I started looking into it and thinking, let's help them. Let's help them make sure that he gets put away because he's still out there. Well, then I started realizing after us digging and talking to Van Buren and talking to other family members that there is no proof. They had zero proof that Kenny killed Egypt. and that the connection between me having two boys is because then I started realizing that holy shit or holy cow, I'm sorry. I was like, holy shit, this could happen to to any of my my kids. And I have a I have a brother. I like and if this happened to any of them and they were blamed for killing somebody and putting it out there, putting their name out there when there was zero proof, there was no evidence that they did it, I would go crazy. So that's really originally how I got involved. And then, and the other thing is I have a daughter. And if someone did this to my daughter, I would want to know exactly who did it and not have a person of interest. I would want to, I would want a conviction. <laughs> so, um, so then I just started, Dwayne and I really, I kept asking Dwayne these hard questions. I kept saying, well, how do you know it was him? Or where, where did they find this? Or did, did they send this to the lab? Did they get this? And his, his answer was, I don't know, Lindsay. I don't know. They just keep telling us. They just kept telling us that it was Kenny. They know who did it. They need one more piece of evidence. So that's when we decided that we should have a meeting with uh, Van Buren because at this point they had not yet talked to Dwayne. This was 18 months, a year and a half after his sister was murdered, unsolved. They still had never talked to her brother, either of her brothers, any like her family members. They had not called them in. So I remember looking at him saying, you know, questioning him, where were you? Where were you that night? You, who am I dating? Who am I going to meet? Like, introduce my kids to? What is going on? And so I needed to make sure he wasn't there because in my eyes, I don't know, everyone's a suspect. And so um, clearly once he was, <laughs> he was able to, to verify where he was and, and I, and uh, he was, he was clear. She was like investigating. You're like, all right, I, I cleared you. Dwayne's like, what? I didn't know I was under suspicion. You're like, you were. You were. I know. Second. I know. So it was crazy. So then, yeah, so that, that's really how, how I got so invested in, and in just seeing the hurt and getting to know Tina, the relationship between Tina, Egypt, and Dwayne's mother grew and I realized that nobody believed her when she kept saying I don't know if it was Kenny no one said that it wasn't none of us ever said it wasn't Kenny but we would not say that it was him until he was proven and so then we started realizing that 
there's no way that that he did it. And um, so that that was um, what drove us then is then if he didn't do it or if he's a part of it, that'll all come out too. She needs justice in the community. That was the other thing. I couldn't imagine living. We don't live in Belleville, Ypsilanti, Van Buren Township, you know, local. Great. So but I can't imagine living there knowing that there's still a killer out there. We didn't know where if he or she was still living locally or not, but there's a possibility that he or she, whoever did it, was still living there. And Van Buren, nothing, nothing was happening. They weren't using all of their resources. They weren't allowing Michigan State Police to use their immense amount of resources to to help them. And that just was disgusting to me. And it's not fair to the community. And that was kind of how we got the backing of the community. It's kind of crazy to me that people wouldn't be able to understand, one, just basic empathy, becoming involved in wanting someone's family to be able to start healing, to want justice for a person that, that they don't know. But especially when you're dating a, ma- a member of that family and now you are going to marry a member of yeah. that family and it will basically become your family too. Yeah. So this is now your own family member, something that's directly affecting them, that emotionally draining them. It's just, it's just absolutely flabbergasting to me that there yeah. would ever be a question of why would you care about this? Of course I care about this. Yes, and I have to remind myself, and, and not only me, but Dwayne and I are very good about reminding each other about this because his hurt is so much more than mine because this is his family that's doing this to him. We just remind each other that for all of those negative, there's about, I would say we could maybe say 10, 10 people who are who are not kind. That leaves 3,680 who are amazing, you know, like on that page. You know, so we just have to remind ourselves like that it's just a small, small amount. But damn, does that hurt? You know, when when it's one that that you know you at one point we're we're very close to, and so we we do a good job with just reminding each other of that. And uh, it, typically, when I have a bad day, he's he's up. If he has a bad day, uh, I try to be up. So um, we've we've figured it out, and um, yeah, but. It is, isn't it? It's astounding. It is. It's crazy. And more people are being brought to the group every day. So at the time of the announcement of the original announcement that Timothy Moore had been arrested, the group had 2.7 thousand members in mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. because I wrote it down. I want to know exactly how many there was at that mm-hmm. very moment. That's another thousand people almost. Yeah. Yeah. We're at 3.7. Yeah. Just Almost in the last few months, just more people finding out, more coverage for her case, and yeah. who knows how much just having other people know who's been arrested, what information could possibly be provided now that there are suspects in custody. Well, you know, there were um, there are so many thousands of people in that township that uh, were all connected in this web. And that had the preconceived notion of that it was kind of, they heard it from the family, they heard it from the police. And so they didn't, they didn't want to look into anything. I don't blame them. And then when somebody comes out and they're being arrested, oh my gosh, let's look at it. Let's check this out. I, I could, I could only imagine the, the spark, you know, that happened amongst so many people. So unfortunate because you were using the internet to yell to the top of your lungs. We yes. need help. help. We need other resources. Yep. We need tips. We, we need something because yes. this case isn't moving and some people listened and built a support network around you and that's wonderful. But some people just were like, well, they're, they're feeling their grief. It's just they can't accept it mm-hmm. or something of that nature. So mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of sad, but it's, it's great to see that the group is still gaining traction and hopefully more tips and more information can be generated from that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So this now brings us back to the timeline. We have that first event on the anniversary of Egypt's passing. 
and Michigan State Police is brought on to assist. And then let's talk about what happens after. After you held the event on the anniversary of Egypt's death and MSP was brought on to assist, there was an incident with the township clerk. Can you walk us through what happened there? Okay, so we found after the Michigan State Police uh, started assisting, we found out quickly that they needed really just to take the whole case over. So we started sending out emails each and every day, um, not only to the community this time, but to state representatives, to all of the township leaders, like the clerk, um, representatives, to the supervisor, to the attorney general. So each and every day we put out same information on stuff that went wrong, uh, what Van Buren didn't do, um, something new every day. So we're driving it in to, because. Yeah, it was the same topic, but just different information. And we were pulling in help from the community, allowing them to use their voice too that they're discussed and not allowing the state to happen. And one big thing that we ask at the end of every single email, every single one, we said, if this was your daughter, would you be okay with the case being handled like this? And we never once, never once got a single response to that question. So then uh, most of the emails were coming from my email address, and I would CC than Dwayne on it. But so this particular this, day, this one day I said, "Okay, um, Lindsay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna send out the email today. I, I have something I I wrote up, so I want to start sending some things out from my email. I sent the first one out. It was, it was named Smoke and Mirrors. And when I was headed off to work, I get this response. Our first real response. Well, well, his in this email, you guys, it wasn't anything like negative at all. I have it pulled up right here. It's just giving facts." Uh, he's saying since 2017, VVPD has stated that Michigan State Police and the FBI is, in quotes, involved. That's all smoke and mirrors. And then he gave one, two, three, four, five bullet points on how VVPD was lying that MSP and FBI are involved. We gave exactly a proof where they really aren't involved. And then at the end of it, he says, if this was your daughter, would you be okay with how this investigation is being handled? That's That's all that it. It was. And then, yeah, then Dwayne's on his way to work, and I get a phone call saying, Lindsay, I got a reply. Did you see? Leanne Wright, the, ta- the township clerk, replied. And I was like, what? I didn't get a reply. So <laughs> I look, and he pulls over, and he figures out, you know, he's like, what? You didn't? So then he figured out that uh, he forwarded it to me. And the reply from the township clerk of Van Buren Township in Michigan says, Is there any way these emails to everyone can be blocked? I'm personally not interested in the stupidness. Clerk Wright. So as you can imagine, being her brother, I mean, I guess you can say how that, like, what that triggered in you. I had to absorb it. I was like, is he, is he being facetious? Like, is he, is there something I'm reading wrong here? And then, um, you know, as I noticed everybody that was taken off of there, it was definitely not meant for me to see. And I have a different last name than my sister. I'm a Turner instead of Covington. So it became apparent that he was trying, he blocked his constituents and was, uh, talking to the main people that, uh, that run the township that have been in there for years, the good old boys club. Um, he erased me, Tina, the attorney general, all of the MSP detectives that we had on it, uh, the state representatives. And accidentally left Dwayne right in the two section because he wasn't CC'd on it. So he didn't, he only um, deleted people that were in the CC column. So, I mean, just, uh, so clearly this isn't the first time that they've talked poorly about citizens, constituents, and he's calling Egypt Covington stupidness and us trying to get the Michigan State Police to take over her case. He's calling that stupidness. I so bad wanted to make fun of the word stupidness, but then I thought, "Mm, you better look that up, Lindsay, before you start making fun of it. And damn it, it is a word. (laughs) I can't can't make fun of it, but it's a word. It's wildly inappropriate. Especially for an email. It wasn't a conversation with just one coworker or something like that in a private setting where you say things you really shouldn't, but no one's ever really going to know. It's just a personal conversation. It was an email from a work yes, email. This was on, yeah, and it was, it was from, yes, it was from his 
Van Buren email. It wasn't personal email. Yeah, and it was on, so this was on August 12th, 2020. So this is three years and two months after he was murdered, and they're still, they're mad at us for fighting for a loved one. And so then we just, we sent a reply and then, added back on the attorney general and all of the Michigan State Police people and um, state representatives. So they were back onto the feed and just asking them to elaborate. Uh, I just said, can you please elaborate on exactly what is stupid as it pertains to Egypt's murder, which happened in your jurisdiction and has gone unsolved for three years. And then I said a couple other things to them, nothing, you know, terrible, just saying like blocking a constituent is not a good look and that kind of stuff. And so uh, we did not get a reply to that one. <laughs> but that, that's just, that's probably the worst that, that has happened. That um, And, and the, the funny part, too, is that he had no idea. He thought one of his coworkers went behind his back and forwarded that to us. So he thought that he was getting played by one of his representatives. <laughs> but really, he just doesn't know how to work technology. <laughs> yes. Yep. So yes. Yeah, this situation here. And then you had the township meeting that we'll get into that led to the, the second um, protest, which brought Michigan State to the table and uh, decided that they'd take it over fully. Yeah, yeah. So we had Leon write this this email. So then we decided to have a protest against him to, to, to have him resign. And the community was outraged by this. And if he's talking like this about her, of course, he's talking about other people. So in four days, we, with the help of, an incredible activist named Trisha. She helped us put together the protest in four days. Well, the day before the protest was the township hall meeting. And Dwayne and I didn't tell anyone we were getting on it. And we just decided just to show up and surprise them. So when it came to the public comments, we raised our hand via Zoom. And <laughs> um, so we requested that he please give Egypt's case 100% fully to Michigan State Police. We don't want Van Buren a part of anything. We want Michigan State Police in charge and Van Buren to assist if needed. He said to us, we will not give this case to Michigan State Police. If we give it to them, they are going to put it in the basement in Lansing in a drawer with all the other cold cases. And we so shocked. So that's what, how he felt about Michigan State Police. Clearly, he thinks that they can't do anything. So I sent that recording to Michigan State Police, the detectives that we had working on our case, and I said, hey, look, this is what they're saying about you if you guys take over. Well, the next day, MSP went out to Van Buren and was able to convince uh, Van Buren to give the case up to them. Because it's a township hall, we knew that it had to be recorded. So that's why we chose not to tell anybody. We didn't want them to prep for for their answers, and um, and that's why we were able to send it then over to MSP and have them just watch it for themselves and see their body language, and um, it was it was so eye opening. It's on our the whole thing is on our Facebook page too. If anyone wants to see it, <laughs> absolutely, and that link will be in the show notes as well. And, and so that brings us to where we're at now and right after they got it I think like you had said earlier you did a great job explaining where we're at now and getting arrests and um you know getting just it's it's been it's been such such a different experience from one uh, department to the other and yeah it's it's been uh completely uh 180 uh how they constantly communicate with us and they prep us for the different stages of trying to find somebody to investigating to um, it's just every detail and being right along, uh, you know, just kind of holding our hands the whole way. And it was beautiful. Yep. <laughs> At some point you find out that Van Buren PD didn't pass on everything from Egypt's case files to Michigan State Police. Can you explain that portion to us a little bit, how you found that out? Yeah, so when we – and this was, this was one of – goes back to kind of when uh, – after that first protest when Van Buren reached out the next day and asked for assistance. And, and Duane had mentioned that we quickly realized that assistance wasn't good enough. And that's one of these examples is that when we went to a meeting with 
Michigan State Police right after they gained assistance and started asking them questions and saying, well, you know this and you know this, right? And you have this information, right? And they were like, no, uh-uh, we don't have that. That's all new to us. And it was all stuff that that Van Buren should have absolutely given to MSP. So we quickly realized that they were not giving them all of their information. Well, we later found out that they had just given only, I would say, not even half of the documents um, in the case. Yeah, it was close because it was just the paper documents, it, none of the electronic. Yeah, we're, all, we're handed over to MSP. And so Van Buren wasn't even giving everything, which in their, in their defense, they didn't have to. They didn't have to do that. So they didn't do anything wrong because the case was still theirs. They just allowed MSP to assist. So once we realized that, it wasn't it wasn't good enough. They, they did it to appease us. They, they they had no intention of asking Michigan State to do anything, to uh, assist in anything. As long as they had their name right there, the protests will stop. We'll stop harassing them on on township halls and emails. That was their only intention. Right. It was just a matter of how could Michigan State Police completely assist with this case if they don't have all the information yep. to be able to do that. <laughs> so then they would be going back to try and do the groundwork that's already been done and effectively wasting their own time. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You started sending out Did You Know Facts Daily. Can you tell me a little about what some of those facts entailed? Yeah. I mean, there was – I mean, another example is one of the detectives – well, the head detective on – Egypt's case from Van Buren, packet dialed someone that we know when he was on the crime scene, the scene of another crime, another um, homicide investigation. And so just, and, and was saying very inappropriate things about this loved one. And so that was just another thing like, hey, did you guys know this? Because we are sure that they, he didn't go and share that with the representatives and MSP. And the carelessness of, of this department needed to be told. Because it kept happening over and over and over again. Little things like, uh, did you know that they're telling you that MSP was involved when the only thing that actually happened was they used their labs, which every department uses Michigan State Police, the state labs, and they also used their canine dogs one time right after her murder. They used their, their canine dogs one time. So that's their, their way of getting around and saying MSP was involved. We talked to people at the FBI, and we know for a fact that they were not involved. Van Buren told us that they talked to eight profilers, and he said the latest and the greatest profilers uh, in Michigan, and but couldn't give you a name. When we asked for, hey, can you just tell us the names? You don't have to right now, but when you look back through your files, can you just send me the names of the, the eight profilers that you talked to? And that was when his answer was, Lindsay, they're the latest and the greatest. And <laughs> what, what they're referring to, and what they're referring to, the reason why they can say that there's some involvement, is they went to a conference and they brought Egypt's files with them. And you know, amongst all these other officers and departments, they said, "Oh yeah, I think we're on. You're on the right track." Well, if you only bring a file full of Kenny's name in it, <laughs> oh, you're going to get that as the answer. Yeah, of course you're going to. You're going to say, "Oh yeah, yeah, you're, you're mm-hmm. doing the right thing." Okay, next person. Yeah, and uh, I respect that you guys can laugh about this at this point. Now that yeah. now that things have progressed to where they are, because I can't imagine the amount of frustration while it was happening. Uh, mm-hmm. There was also something I don't know if you emailed it or not, but about the affidavit that was left at someone's house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, that was a big one. Thank you for reminding. There's so many. That's why when you say, can you read some, I'm like, oh, there's so many. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you might forget them. Sorry. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a really good. That's actually what some started this all, too, is, uh, yeah, so the the Buren, the, the night that they found Egypt, that she was found, they had warrant to search three of Kenny's properties, his truck and two different homes. And they had sent the the magistrate, Magistrate Hindman, to sign the search warrant or affidavit. 
So he signed it, but he said, don't go execute this until you send me the search warrant. I need to sign that before you execute it, and I will. You just need to send it to me. Well, Van Buren didn't go and get that executed, and they went and uh, – or, I'm sorry, they didn't get it signed, and they went over to Kenny's house and Kenny's mom's house and left the search warrant affidavit, which – so I kind of say it like um, everyone knows what it is because I had no clue what it was in the beginning. So I'm just so used to talking about it now. So I'm just going to – an affidavit, a search warrant affidavit has all the details, all the details of how Egypt was found. That w- That is how people found out that she was tied in Christmas lights. Otherwise, that would have been something that only the killer would have known. Would have been guilty knowledge. Yeah. So it had all of that information on it. And they left that. And that's supposed to stay sealed unless and until a conviction. So the the trial for that, for a conviction. So that should never have been opened except when after the trial had begun. Well, they left that unsealed at Kenny's mom's house. <laughs> so, so from day one, they left that there. She had She had all the information. I mean, it's wow. the things that they did. And so we asked them about it, and their answer is, we followed all protocol. We always do. <laughs> which brings us to, which brings us to today. The elephant in the room for Van Buren Police Department is that the state police almost instantly had suspects, gathered evidence on those suspects, and filed formal charges against two of them within the first three to four months of being in control of the case. First, a man named Timothy Moore was arrested, and then the very day that we were conducting this interview, a second suspect had been arrested the day before and was arraigned that day and his name is Shane Lamar Evans. Both of these men, of course, still have to go through the trial process and be found guilty, but in such a short amount of time, after years of battling with the local police, finally, some amount of justice for Egypt is within arm's reach. Of course, we are going to continue to be updating all of you on this case as it progresses, as it goes through the trial process, and we will be doing another episode either towards the end of the trial process or once that process is complete. What advice would you give to families of unsolved and cold cases that don't believe they'll ever be able to get justice for their loved ones and their cases have been handled improperly? Call Lindsay. Thank you. (laughs) So my advice would be don't give up. Don't give up. If someone tells you that, if someone tells you no, or they tell you that 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 is not your right, you don't have the right to that information, or um, you don't know what you're talking about, go to someone else. Don't give up and learn your right. That was huge is when we started showing confidence in knowing the law and knowing what we deserved and what Egypt deserved as a victim what um, her mother deserved. And so we did a lot of research and got very knowledgeable on it. And that's something that I would highly suggest. And to, to sh- when you get those facts, show those facts. Put them out there and show people that you are going about it in a factual way, in a truthful way. And also when you're learning your rights and then you're putting those facts out there, it's hard. It's so hard to go against authorities. It's not anything that's, that's fun to do. It gets your heart going a little bit, especially in the beginning. Now it's a little bit <laughs> easier for me because I'm much more confident. But it's not easy to go against people who you were raised to do anything for and believe, believe anything that they say. And, and the way that I raise my children is to respect uh, law enforcement and authority, all law enforcement, all authority. And that's not the case. Because there's 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 wonderful, wonderful, wonderful police officers at Van Buren. There are some great Van Buren Township police officers. Unfortunately, the top guys are not wonderful in our opinion. No, you're right. And hold those people accountable. Hold the people who who you trust and who who you know aren't doing the right thing. Because 
that that's our job we're, as taxpayers is hold these people accountable. The worst thing that they could say is no or decline a FOIA request, which many of them did, and we just kept coming back with more and more FOIA requests because we knew we, we had the right to that information, and we knew we had the right to the 911 call, and they tried to tell us we didn't, and you just got to keep pushing them. I have uh, one more piece of advice, and that's coming um, as a family member who uh, cleaned up the crime, crime scene afterwards, meaning just their house or belongings gathered mm-hmm. and emptied the place out. Um, if if I had gone back and, and known this kind of situation, I, I would have never packed anything up. I would have never cleaned anything, um, gave away items to close friends while it's an open investigation. When everything's solved, everything's solved, everybody can have their pieces of, of loved items that they shared with her, but I, I wouldn't have done any of that. That's a great point. It's a great tip. And keep track of if if and when you do choose to give away items to loved ones, track of that, of who gets what, and and keep it really tight uh, rein on, on that, at least knowing who it is. So that was that's a very good piece of advice. But. I think what happens is we all, like Lindsay were saying, are raised to to trust in the police and in the system. And if they say, oh, we're done with the crime scene, of course, you're just going to start the process of grieving that happens after death and dealing with all of those worldly possessions and getting financial things in order. By the time most people get to the point that you are at, it's too late for them as well because they did exactly what you did. They've packed up belongings. Maybe they're in storage. Maybe they've been given away. Maybe they've went to Goodwill because they wouldn't have thought to do anything else because yep. the police cleared the scene. That's right. Yep, that's where we're going from. So moving forward, Dwayne and I, and I know Tina as well, that's where we're looking uh, as our new path to help families. And no one ever thinks that this is going to happen to you. And if if it does happen or if it happens to someone that you know, you can be that person to say, hold on, but Let's do this. Let's do this a little bit careful. Let's slow down. Let's make sure we do this and this and this and, and have us. Uh, th- that's where we want to go. That's where we want to go with our podcast. Can't stop, won't stop. Make families aware of the different obstacles that you might come across if, unfortunately, you have to go through this. So it just we have we have a lot of advice because of what yeah. we've been through, and it's unfortunate that we have all the Save advice. So much but time. now we want to help. Save so much time and hardship. If you only knew kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I do feel like you guys did a great job of taking what you had and putting it to use in the knowledge in such a unique way. For example, <laughs> going into the township office, making sure things were on the record, on public record, getting those responses to mm-hmm. having events and having multiple events in a very short period of time, knowing, mm-hmm. okay, there's eyes on us now, but do it again and do it quickly and keep amping and raising that bar. It's really important when it comes to community outreach. Yeah, it was very calculated and this community never, never ceases to amaze me and us. And it just, it's, it's a community that I've never seen a love, a bond coming amongst so many people that don't even know each other. So many of us who are now very close and talk regularly, didn't know each other, all of us, you know, and then we just came together for this one tragic event, but it's building up the community and it's made such a beautiful bond in Van Buren Township. It has to be done right. And fortunately, it worked out. Now that you have done the thing to raise awareness and there are currently two suspects in custody, What is your next step in coming to terms with the trial and getting through the trial and deciding what to do after? You know, we're, uh, we're able to, to sit back a little bit because we, we have, um, this investigation. It's still ongoing with the people that we trust most and that's the Michigan State Police, um, and the prosecuting office. Um, they've, they've gave us confidence. 
Um, so we keep ourselves busy with our family events and, and trying to help other families at this time. Um, and we're prepared to be w- with or in the trial if we're just ready to go. It's, yeah, we don't have to do the same things that we had to before. Yeah, it's it's been so nice. We don't we don't have to come up with a bunch of theories and and wondering. Yeah, do we naturally? Yeah, we do. We want to know why and a motive, but we're confident that we will eventually figure that out. It just I think everything is just going to fall into place. And the reason that we're so confident is is like Dwayne said, is Michigan State Police have been incredible through through all of this. It's been night and day working with them than with uh, Van Buren, and it's been really hard for us. And it's been a long road of great communication between us and MST because they knew the lack of trust that we have and had for law enforcement. So it's been a work in progress, but it's just nice that we can kind of sit back a little bit and know that the job is being done and things are going to pan out and we just have full faith and trust that uh, we hadn't had before. So moving forward, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready for the, for the trial. We're ready to get this going and for for what the future holds. And we're ready to get married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that'll happen after the trial sometime. And just we just want to get this done, and then we're gonna we're ready and uh, ready to continue on Egypt's legacy and use her memory towards everything. All of the rest of our future plans, everything is gonna be kind of in her memory and make trying to make her proud. <laughs> So if someone's listening to this right now and they say, I need to know how to do that, I need that help, is there a place that they can contact you currently? Yeah, absolutely. Come on to our page, Justice for Egypt, Truth Behind the Investigation, or my personal page, my I'm Lindsay Ann, and just come on there and message me. Message me, and I get multiple messages a day. I'm actually starting my podcast is going to be launching within the next couple of weeks, like very soon here. So that's going to be launching and I'm going to be helping families. That's what I want to do. So I want people to reach out to me, at least start giving me some names so I can be in touch. I want to be in touch with every family that I uh, work with, that I'm helping and talking about cases. And um, so, yeah, if anyone wants help, please, please reach out and just message me on Facebook or on Instagram. I'm at my Lindsay Ann on Instagram or just Lindsay Ann on uh, Facebook. Yeah. But thank you both yeah. so much. We, of course, again, just want to thank Lindsay and Dwayne for joining us. We absolutely appreciated it, especially with such a hectic, hectic day that they had in front of them that they still made time for us. Thank Thank you you for all your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is all for today's episode, but we will see you in the new year. We'll, of course, have a new survey so that you can pick our content for 2021, which will hopefully be a better year. And we'll see you then. Until next time, I'm Mo. (laughs) I'm Chip. I'm Mikey. I've got nothing clever for you. Stop my recording. You just listened to the Deep Dark Truth Podcast. See you next time. And remember... Your local cryptids want to meet you.